my favorite pose. <laughs> Hey, I was talking to the Lord today, and God said, do James. I went, what? We just did James. You know, I mean, I, I don't want to go back into James, you know, blow people out, you know, and tell them, you know, to open their Bible to the book of James, you know, and have to kind of like, you know, deal with this again. It's like, what was wrong with the first time? And God said, nothing to me. Because <laughs> you see, lots of times we get a word from the Lord, or the Lord tells us something, or maybe He just gives you an impression. I don't know. Maybe you, you're one of those impressionable kind of people. Maybe you're one of those kind of guys that, you know, it's like you, you get a feeling, you know, nothing more than feeling, but, you know, you get a feeling, you know, and you kind of run with it, you know, and you put your faith in it, you know, and you build it up, and you blow it up, and you... You know, look all around for where it went, you know, and you try to find the circumstances that fit, you know, and you kind of put it all together and you go, okay, I got God's will. Well, okay, you know. I kind of take the hint the first time. I like to go with the flow, you know, what I mean? <laughs> go with the flow, you know, and I kind of like to, if God gives me a still small voice, you know, to listen to, then I kind of like to attune my ears to hear what the Spirit may say to me. I like to kind of like sharpen my focal point to be the object of what I want to hear from the person I want to know and the reality of how he speaks and what he speaks to me so I would not miss those opportunities to hear him speak and to know him in a more personal and intimate way. That's kind of why we talk a lot about that, you know, in Vidibo and we talk a lot about that in this ministry because why would you not want to know or to hear God speak? Why would you not want to follow His will? Why would you want to go anywhere or do anything without having God tell you to do it? I mean, you know, quite bluntly, I mean, isn't it kind of stupid that you have opportunity to know the future, to know what's going to happen tomorrow, as well as today, and to not check in with the one who knows what's going to happen? To not ask Him to plan out your day to avoid the pitfalls, you know, like, hey God, you know, if it's all up to you, you know, I'd rather not fall in the pit today. I'd rather avoid that way, you know, that maybe maybe there's road construction. I don't want to go there. I'd like to be on time today, God. Maybe you could kind of like make it work out so my day walks according to your will. And since you know what time is better than I do, since you put the sun and the moon and the stars into place for their seasons and, you know, appointed times, Maybe you could appoint to me certain times throughout my day that I'm kind of like going in your will and your way so that I'm in your appointed time at your appointed place doing your appointed will. You know, appointed. You know, like God pointing. Now, in the Old Testament there is a place where God did point out something to one of the kings that was, you know, kind of like using all the holy things, you know. And God pointed his finger on the wall and started writing, you know, and went... Many, many tekel ufarsum, and I meant, whoa, not good, you're in trouble, you know. And so, I kind of like to think of it as, I'd rather check in than be checked out, you know. It's like I don't want someone to come in to my place, you know, and check me out, you know, without me being checked in with what God is doing in this day, so that if I do have to check out, you know, this life, that I have fulfilled that purpose with which God planned for me today, much less tomorrow or whatever other day, that I did His will according to His way and not my own. So, I kind of like to, you know, like kick back, you know, and I like to chill. It. Oh, by the way, this is, you know, if, if you're wondering, you know, what this is, it's like, here, let me, let me introduce you, you know, because over on the other side, you know, you can see kind of like where my office, whoops, wrong way, let's go the other way. Okay, we're going exit stage back behind me, and that's kind of where I sit in the other chair. And yeah, that's that's basically where my back is, you know, because I have back problems, and I have arm problems, and I have arthritis problems, and I have bowel problems. Matter of fact, I got lots of problems. That's why I read James a lot, because I count it all joy. But that's a window that, you know, we're beginning to look out over, and it's the third story, you know, and there's my wandering Jews, you know, they're kind of like hanging out, you know. Well, well, the thing I like about my wandering Jews, they know how to hang out. You know, they're just hanging loose. Get it? Kind of like everything in my life. I purposely design my offices and my life, you know, to have 
specific meaning and design so that way I look at them and I'm reminded of how I ought to be. Like those wandering Jews above me that are hanging loose. You know, that's what I think of every time I look at them. They're hanging loose. They'll grow anywhere. They're, they're hard to kill. They'll reroute no matter what you do. You know, you cut them off anywhere and they'll reroute. Just put water on them, they'll grow. You know, anywhere they go, they grow. You know, I mean, just one of those things. Wandering Jews, they're hard to kill. Just don't water them and they'll die. You know, and that kind of reminds me of things. So, you know, I love my wandering Jews. You know, and I got my other, you know, plant there, a little red one. People know what that is. I can't remember. But it's remindful of me that it was a plant that my wife never thought was going to survive, and I made it grow. <laughs> and then it blossoms and blooms out, blooms like crazy. You, know, you got all kinds of red flowers on it in the winter. Same thing with the other plant that's over here on the other side, you know, that's kind of like right there, you know, extra stage, you know. And so it's kind of neat that I have these opportunities, you know, to demonstrate and to give the teachings and analogies of what a container is and how we are planting of the Lord and that God puts us sometimes into a container so that we would root and that we would grow up into the fullness of the stature of Jesus Christ so that we would bear fruit and we would bear much fruit even as these flowers do. And I even get my uh, wandering Jews sometimes to bear fruit, you know, and they flower sometimes. But, you know, I just wanted to introduce you, you know, to where I do a lot of my work, you know, kind of like a lot of my things in this little mini office now because we're not sitting outside and by golly, there's the actual computer, you know, we're kind of working in the office today kind of trying to accomplish some things, you know, and trying to get some things done. So we have lots of opportunities, you know, that God has provided, you know, for me, you know, to make things work, you know, to give credit to where credit is due. I'm just one poor slob like you, sharing, caring, and taking what I have in my hands, and oftentimes giving it away freely to those people that don't have or do, or do have sometimes. I even give to wealthy people, you know, that which I have, you know, blows their minds, they're thinking, What's a poor kid like you doing giving me something? You know, I'm like, well, you know, that's the way I work. You know, it's the way I roll. You know, like one bro from another church said, this, man, it's the way I roll. You know, I was like, yeah, cool, dude. You know, now I understand that there are people that have to have, you know, paneled houses and, you know, have to set up things for their kids and for their family and for their church and for their neighbor and for their nation and for their relatives and for all the other things. I'm not one of those people. I've lived my life according to the principles that I read, you know, in the scriptures. When Jesus said, you know, Give up this for his, you know, the poor, whatever, go sell, you know, all you got. I did. I sold all I had, you know. Matter of fact, I've done it more than once, you know. <laughs> Whenever I felt like that, you know, I needed a object or abject lesson in order to bring it truthful to the people and other them to understand the scriptures and the word of God, how real it is, I did it. You know, so anything that I read in the word, I did, or I tried, or I lived, you know, and I don't have a problem with knowing it's a fact. You know, that's why I've used this analogy a lot of times with people to say, you know, you could tell me, you know, if you're a fundamentalist, you know what I'm going to say. Um, you could tell me you're a literalist, but you're not. No offense to you, but you're not. I'm Jewish. Trust me. Don't use the word unless you mean it. Yes is yes. No is no. I don't go anywhere beyond that. My wife is very um, well trained in that perspective that don't tell me maybe. I don't want to know maybes. I don't want to know ifs, ands, or buts. But if you say yes, I'm going to hold you to your yes. If you say no, I'm going to hold you to your no. If I tell her no, I won't do it. I may reconsider and the next day do something else or whatever or say yes. Or I may sit down, ponder, consider the facts, you know, talk about it and say, I did say no and this is why I said no and this is what it is. But now that you present this information, I'm, I'm, I'm changing my mind. I'm deciding to make a correction or a choice, a repentance, a difference, a differentiation of designation of the direction that I'm going and I'm going to say yes now. So my yes is yes. If I tell you yes, I'll do it. I'll be there. I'll be there. If I'm not there, I'm working there. I'm going there. I'm trying to get there in one way or another. You know, and usually I pretty much, you know, have had a thousand percent success rate on that, you know. But my point is this. The word is the word. If it isn't in there, then it isn't there. But if it's there, it's there for a reason and a purpose and a, and a design. And it's not to be interpreted. It's not to be... Well, let's put it this way. It is to be interpreted, and it is literal, and it is spiritual, and it is emotional, and it is physical, and it is a manifestation of the reality of Jesus Christ made flesh that you could see in heaven words that are living, that are moving in this kind of spiritual dimension. And it's kind of like, woo you know, kind of like weird, but yeah, strange, you know, but that's how it works in heaven. But my point is this. It's literal. 
because it is literal and it is spiritual and it is allegorical and it is metaphorical and it is all these things similes and metaphors and, you know, we'll go there someday but in James you know one of the interesting things that you know I, I wanted to bring out and also I wanted to mention you know while we're looking at the computer you know we're kind of like talking from this perspective of where we're at by the way there's my wife you know kind of like there and there you know it's kind of like, that was at the purple people or the purple the purple bubble ball something like that the purple ball but anyways it was just like you had to dress up in purple you know and that's how we met you know it was like I brought her up to Alaska you know and, and um, we dated you know and I got her a job you know and she got a job you know and she was working you know and she got on her feet and she became more of a whole person then I dated her and then I married her and then she got saved well I think she got saved before I married her but she got saved first then I married her and then I said you know if we're going to be together well I said if we're going to get married you got to get saved you know so she got saved and then she got she developed a personal relationship with God and then I watched to see if it was true we stayed in Alaska you know while we were developing you know stayed out of ministry you know kind of stayed you know in development stage where I was allowing her to grow in the Lord you know with the tapes that I had and things you know and her own personal choices that she made of her own free will and as she developed you know then she would ask me questions and I'd mention them or we'd argue you know and I'd yell at her <laughs> in Alaska you can yell at somebody guess what they ain't going nowhere <laughs> where are you going to go ha <laughs> try that one again but you know there was a certain amount of especially if you've been through divorce or you've been through any kind of relationship termination of any type whether you divorced yourself from the church by the way divorce is no big deal God hates divorce but it wasn't just divorce of marriage God hates divorce from a pastor God hates divorce from a ministry God hates divorce from the nation God hates divorce from people God hates relationships that terminate that's what he means by divorce the word divorce doesn't apply to only uh, quote unquote marriage, which is the union of two physical bodies that have come together in a covenant relationship, a contractual relationship that has more ramifications to it than what even Gentiles and evangelicals talk about today. I mean, quite frankly, you know, there's more going on that we don't even talk about in marriage, you know, and I'd love to get into it, but you know, unfortunately, you know, I don't have eternity to go through all this stuff. But I've gone through marriage, you know teaching and counseling and counsel people and taught them and you know we can get into the you know deviant behavior of most evangelicals right now and you know I tell you you know it's in the word of God you know all you gotta do is go proverb you know proverbial on you you know I'll tell you what the law says you know and how it applies spiritually and how it applies physically and how it applies emotionally and how it applies you know intellectually and how it applies you know all ways into some way that you can designate you know within your own understanding and the Holy Spirit apply to you so that you'll see Jesus in it and that's why if you can't see Jesus in it why are you doing it so guess what sex isn't just meant for procreation it's meant to be that you can see Jesus in it and there's three people involved when it comes to you know the intercourse that we're talking about you know the interrelationship of two physical beings and their soul and their spirit that have joined together well, the same thing is true in the oneness of God. When God prayed for his disciples, it was the same word, intercourse, and it was meant to be that oneness that God has with the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. That's what we have when we come together as Jesus in me, Jesus in my wife. Together we join conju conjugally. That becomes the Trinity of God, the God had made manifest in the union of what we call, quote-unquote, sex. Which is sad because it's really not sex, but it's actual reality of the manifestation of the unity of the Father, Son, and Spirit to the entire universe. And that's what it's supposed to be. Now, people don't think of it as being, you know, you're on stage for the universe to watch. But dare I say, your marriage bed is on stage for the universe watching. All you, um, what do they call those people that want to be on stage? Uh, anyways, whatever it is. So, you know, to get into it, you know, more bluntly and, and in reality, Whenever there are people that go through any kind of divorce, whether it be of a marriage or of a child or of a relationship in the church or a relationship in the family, it's a divorce. It is a divorce. The children of Israel were divorced from God at one point in time. You know, they, your sins have separated you from God. You know, and there's a, a whole huge teaching about just the word itself, the concept itself, I should say, because in Jewish culture, it's never about one word. The word itself covers a expression of meaning that goes beyond the simple one word definition divorce is not like oh well you know we broke contract no you didn't just break contract you did a lot more there's ramifications specifications designations intonations there's 
ripple effects that go out into the spiritual dimension, there's ripple effects that go out into the physical dimension, there's ripple effects that go out into the emotional dimension, and all kinds of things that happen. So, you know, it's like, you know, rather than get so, you know, heavenly minded that we're all earthly good and that you'd never want to commit divorce again because you think, all that's involved in marriage? I don't want to get married, man. That's confusing. Well, you know, quite frankly, you know, imagine what God looks like, you know, when you're standing there in heaven looking down, you know, like, they don't get it. That's what Jesus tried to say when he came from heaven to earth. You don't get it. You don't understand what you're doing. You're losing it, you know, so we need to get this back on perspective, you know, you're, you're doing the wrong thing for the wrong reason the wrong way. And that's why, you know, when the, the Pharisees came to Jesus and tried to confuse him or tried to abuse him or tried to, you know, deceive him or tried to trick him or tried to, you know, put him into a trap, you know, they came up with the logical asking of certain physical realities that they were saying about what heaven might be when it came to marriage, you know. But he, Jesus threw it right back at him. He says, look, you're neither married nor given marriage. You're even as angels are in heaven. And there's a lot more to that than what it meets the eye, which, you know, if I get to that at some point in time in scriptures, you know, I'll bring out the halakhic Jewish side of it, you know, that we don't hear much about. Unless you get into some kind of in-depth study like with the Missler or with uh, John Gill or, you know, some of the old ancients, you know, that have taught about this. I mean, it's not like I'm coming up with anything new. It's like it's all around. Just people don't investigate or research as deep as maybe what I wanted to know, you know, and I wanted to learn. And then God took me there and, you know, and I'd ask God, you know, God, why, what, where, and has anybody else ever done this before? And God says, yes, let me tell you the answer. Now, you go look. You know, and I went, okay, I got the answer from God. Then I go look. I go, whoa, how come nobody else knows this? You know, like, well, it's always been around. So, knowing James, <laughs> see, my middle name is James, so I like James. James is really Yaakov. 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 <laughs> no, not that kind of, but Yaakov. James is Jacob. You know, James really, you know, is Jacob... Which, you know, some people say supplanter, some people say, you know, whatever they want to call it, you know, and they say Jacob was a liar, or a manipulator, or whatever, you know, it's like, you know, platitudes and personifications, simplifying scripture or taking it in some way to make anachronisms or some kind of symbolic gesture to make us feel good, isn't what God wants us to do. God wants us to say, Jacob was a man. Jacob was my man. Jacob saw God. Jacob walked with God. Jacob did things, and accordingly, so do you. Jacob isn't like some kind of, you know, crook only, or some kind of manipulator. Jacob did things that most people do today, and they excuse themselves in some way. It's not meant to be an ethical, moral character study by looking at Jacob and saying what a failure he was. God didn't put Jacob there for that particular reason. Neither does he put the book of James here for the reason to say, oh, brother of Jesus, oh, you know, leader of the church, oh, he was this, oh, he was that. No, he doesn't say that. As a matter of fact, when we read the book of James, we simply come up with a very simple understanding if we look only at the word of God. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad greeting. You know, I always laugh because, you know, whenever I read this first part, I always go, yeah, James is servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes. And then some Gentile, and I'm going to call them Gentiles because, you know, every time that somebody acts like a Gentile, they're a Gentile. And whenever somebody teaches like a Gentile, they're a Gentile. They're not doing according to the Spirit of God. They're not telling the truth. They're not getting it from God. They're getting it from somebody who told them. You know, you'll hear oftentimes this expression, the lost tribes. Who lost them? There's never been any lost tribes. There are no lost tribes. God knows where they are, and so do Jews. No offense. But most Jews, you know, if you get into orthodoxy, if you're Jewish, you know that they know. You know that we know. Guess what? You know, you can check and see. You know where the migratory patterns were of the dispersion process of those tribes that left, and you know what halakhically the rabbinate has said and designated for the tribes and the areas with which Judaism does still operate and has always operated even in diaspora or in this obvious dispersion of the people until the ingathering is fully accomplished and God gathers the Jew from every corner of the earth even as he promised he would in the book of Revelation so 
no offense, the tribes aren't lost. There aren't like two missing. There aren't like one gone, one's here, one's there, you know. Book of Revelation, we can see that in the beginning, you know, there's Manasseh and at the end there's, you know, Ephraim, you know what I mean? Ephraim, Manasseh, I mean, there's 12. Hello, you know, right here. James knew that. This is Book of Acts. This is like, if it was then, what's so hard about it being now? It's only a thousand years. A thousand years isn't that many generations. Think about it. It's only ten generations. Hey, pretty simple. You know, most people are living a hundred years nowadays. Hey, ten generations isn't that long ago. Quite frankly. Now, obviously, some things have come off, you know, and gone on, and, you know, kind of like shocked people. Like, you know, they always come up with this, you know, because of Josephus, you know, all the Jews got thrown out. No, they didn't. It's just like any other place. There were some that stayed, you know, maybe one or two, you know, families, you know, three or four, you know, that stayed in Jerusalem. You know, they were like Bedouins, you know, the Bedouin were there. The, uh, the, the, um, I'm trying to think of the other word for them, but the gypsies were there. You know, the gypsy. Um, matter of fact, I helped um, when I was in Jerusalem. I helped get Israel to recognize the ethnicity of the the Jewish, well, Jewish, the Israeli Jerusalem gypsy as an ethnic people because they never left. They were there. They were, you know, probably servant to porters for the Romans. But you know, I mean, they were there. They stayed there. They didn't go anywhere. They've been there. So the state of Israel recognized him as an ethnic people of the state of Israel. You know, and it was kind of like interesting when I was there that, you know, I helped participate with that and celebrate it with the gypsies. You know, by the way, some of them were Christians, so we got together and we talked on the side of Yeah, you're Christian, you're Jewish. So, James is writing to and talking about and giving greetings to the twelve tribes that are out there that are of the church, you know, that are of all those who are scattered abroad. He isn't just writing only to the believer, he's writing to all Jews because he's writing in such a way that it's meant to be to the unbeliever and to the believer. That's what the Spirit of God does. God speaks to all of us. There is no contextual reality of saying, this is only for, or like sometimes they try to use the Sermon on the Mount and People will say, I, you know, you can't go by the Sermon on the Mount, you know, when they want to offer an excuse. You, you don't want to use the Sermon on the Mount because that's written to the disciples. It wasn't written for the people. Really? You want to go back and read that again? I mean, just in the English without getting somebody to tell you that? You're not going to find that. If you read things simply, it's simply said, and it's simply did. And that's the way it was. It was communicated verbally. It was communicated to people who wrote it down later, but it was still inspired and it was designated exactly the way it is, even with its errors by the Holy Spirit to be the inspired Word of God that in not just its original text, but where it is today, right now, this book, and if I picked up another one, that one too, both of them, because I'm reading them and I have the Holy Spirit inside me, are divinely inspired because the Holy Spirit interprets it for me. He makes applicable the Word of God to me. Forget about all this doctrine dummy stuff, you know, and it's dumb because it's not there. The only thing that was ever continually provided for as far as the actual consistency was the equilateral constancy uh, lettering of the Torah, you know, the five books. That's it. Not the prophets, not the Nephilim, not the writings, the five books of Moses, the Torah, the, the actual literal, literal designation that God said, this is my word, write it down. And so, there's a certain key inside in Jewish culture, not in the evangelical kind of like modern prophecy where they're trying to make things fit and try to make things come up and trying to pull a Nostradamus into Torah, you know, and then go somewhere else and find more and say, oh, well, we found Yeshua here, we found Jesus here, we found, you know, like uh, President Obama here, we found, you know... Uh, Nachmanides here, you know, we found him in this and that and the other thing in there. No, you didn't. You put it in there. You're misled. That's all. But the point is, is that in the yud Hey vav Hey, the Y-H-V-H, you know, the, the, the Yud, it looks like a Y, the Hey, which looks like an H, the Vav, which looks like a V, which is technically, you can't make it any other way except Vav, and yet we get a W out of that. Don't ask. And the Hey is contained in the scriptures because it was meant to be numerically remembered. You could count it out. I mean, that, it's, a, it's just a simple trait of scribal arts. Count out 
across the scroll. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Because master mathematicians can go and go, hey, this is accurate. We do that in Bible code. We have what's called a, at the end of a code, at the end of, um, on the internet, when you send out something from a computer, at the end of it is like a, a CRC. It checks itself to make sure that what was sent was received. The same number of code is written into it so that at the end of it, the same code is received. So that way, if there's an error in between, it doesn't work. But if it's both accurate, it works. It acknowledges, it handshakes, and says, this is true. This works. And so, the CRC is in the Bible. It's the number. That's all. It's pretty simple. It's not like real mystery. You know, it's not, not that confusing. It's not that hard to find. It's not the equilateral spacing, you know, where you can put things in. Although, there is truth to that in some ways, because that's a technique of scribal arts that's done, that we use that, we can call it a haiku. You know, what is the kind of poem that you write in haiku or iambic pentameter when you use 5, 10, 5, 10, you know, and it goes, the type of syllables or the consonants and the syllables work in such a way that it has a sing-song flowing melody that goes all the way through it that the reality of how it's structured is what's called iambic pentameter. That's what Shakespeare used when he was writing. And so he wrote in poetic iambic pentameter. So the same thing was true about the Torah. That's how it's been written. That's how it's been given to us by the Spirit of God so that we would know there's an accuracy and that it would be able to be compared with the inaccuracy if there was someone that came along and tried to change or rearrange the Word of God. And some did, and some tried, and they failed. And so we don't look at ancient script in order to prove the Word of God. We don't look at ancient methodologies in order to know that the Bible is true. We simply read it and it works. And it's true. I know because I can see it, I can hear it, and I can examine it, and I can prove it. Because it works. God works in you both into will and to both to do and to will of his good pleasure. And so he uses your life to prove out the word of God by you proving that he's alive by you proving and demonstrating to yourself, not to others. This isn't, you know, some kind of like, I hate when people try to go, oh, well, I'm going to argue you into the kingdom of heaven. Why? What do you need to argue about God for? God said, in the beginning, God. That's it. You don't need to go any farther than that. You don't have to get some class in I forget, apologetics. I'm not apologizing for God for nothing. You know, I'm not going to apologize to anybody about anything. I'm sorry. You know, you can call it apologetics, but to me, it's just somebody out there acting like they're logical about apologizing. So I'm sorry, but you know this is what I believe. I'm sorry, but this is what I believe. I'm sorry, you don't know. No, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're right. That's what apologetics is. It's sorry about you know what they don't know because if they did know, they wouldn't have to worry about what they got to prove to someone because they can't prove it because God said it and it is. It's so. God said, and every Jew knows this, in the beginning, God. Enough said. Done. That's why it's simple. You don't go there. You don't go apologetic on anybody. You don't have to. God's going to accomplish His will. Nothing in apologetics has ever demonstrated to me that we needed apologetics because the fact of the word of God says that my word will go forth. It will accomplish the purpose I have sent it forth to do. You want to do your words and you want to do your will and you want to do your way and you want to use my Bible? Good, call it apologetics because you're apologizing for who you aren't, which is God. And it's not the word of God. It is the Bible, don't get me wrong. You know, Apologetics is nice in systematic theology or in theology or in some kind of like, you know, logic class. But the reality of intellectualism isn't working with the spiritual depth of what this book is. It's spiritually discerned. You can't apologize or make apologic or apologia to it in the sense of allowing God to still work because you're intervening in your own way of doing rather than letting God work by his dunamis as opposed to the apologia, or apologia, or however you want to say it in the koinia, koinia. Bottom line is, Jews go, hey, I don't need to argue about it. You know, let the rabbis argue. <laughs> That's what they do best. You know, It's like, oh, it's to discuss, you know, try, to try to figure out what it is. But they don't argue about whether it's supposed to be there. It is there. That's the way it is. That's such a deal. So, James wasn't arguing about who he was. He just said, look, I'm, I'm just me. I'm James. I'm a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm just I'm just serving God and I'm serving Jesus. You know, it's like, hey, I'm I'm doing my thing. You know, I'm a person who 
happens to be a servant of God. He didn't call himself a rabbi. He just said he was a servant. He served God. Much like you and I. You shouldn't be looking so much so for titles. You know, if you need a title, you know, go get one off the internet. Because it's about as worthful as the worthless types of things that you have to go out to school to pay huge amounts of money to get in order to be credentialed so that you can go back into the field to get the experience that you don't have based upon your book knowledge that you think you do have so that when you get out in the field you find out that the expert out there who's been doing it all along, who's a journeyman, didn't go to school but you're learning from him all the experiences that he knows based upon what he's learned as he worked in the field. The person who's been there knows it. The person who's learned it from the book doesn't. And that's the point of why we don't do discipleship by book only. It should be by living example. And so that's part of why it's sad when people want to get all this schooling and confused than living out the simplicity of the Word of God. Whatever there tells you to do, God says do it, you know. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, Trust the Lord with all thy heart, lean on thine own understanding, and all thy ways acknowledge him, he'll direct your path. If he directs you to school, great, go. There may be reasons there that have nothing to do with education, but have everything to do with your relationship. Your relationship to God in obedience, your relationship to the teacher, your relationship to the master pupil, your relationship to servanthood, your relationship to intellectually organizing your mind and structuring it in such a way that you could sit down and dissertate the Word of God or explanate or you can um, expound or you can uh, exegize, exegize you know, the Word of God or you can really just relate it in you know, simple words, you know. Quit blowing the way I do it and just relate it. Hey, you know, it's with the relationship of my experience with the Word of God and Jesus talking to me, you know, through it and the Spirit of God giving me the ears to hear and eyes to see and knowing what it is that it means. Woo! We're going there. So, really, a servant of God is all you are. That's all you ever need to be. That's all you ever want to be. You don't want to be a, a master. Why? You don't want to be a king. Why? You don't want to be a whatever you want to put in there. Because Jesus said he was a servant of his Father. He came not to be served, but to serve. Jesus was a servant of all. And of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's kind of interesting, is that, you know, if this James is the James of Jesus, you know, the brother of Jesus, which, you know, Jesus had brothers, and one of them was James. You know, and if this is, which probably is, you know, we're probably pretty confident about that. Although, you know, since it doesn't say, you know, it does say that, you know, he in most of your Bibles, you know, that he was. But, you know, again, hey, you know, it's the Word of God. I'm going to go with what it says without it saying it. If it doesn't say it directly, I'm not going to go indirectly. So if he was the brother of Jesus, it is kind of interesting that he made himself of a servant to be servant unto his brother. Would you be a servant unto your brother? Would you offer yourself under the authority of your brother? Or are you not your brother's keeper? You see, Cain and Abel had an interesting relationship. They were brothers. And Cain made the statement after killing Abel, Am I my brother's keeper? And the reality of what the answer is, is right here, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are your brother's keeper. You are the keeper of the flame, the keeper of the faith. You are the testimony of Jesus Christ. You are the witness. You are serving, not the church. You are serving, not your title. You are serving not the people that you are a pastor over. You are serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And if God says go and you don't, you're not serving the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're doing without asking, then you're not serving the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're acting without ever praying, then you're not serving the Lord Jesus Christ. What did Jesus tell you to do today? What has He given you today in hearing His voice and walking in His Word and knowing His will? What has He told you to do today? then you're a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Otherwise, don't call yourself that. James was operating according to the Spirit of God as he was being directed to write this book, to write this letter, to have it included eventually, because he did do it, in what we call the canon, or into the inclusion of what we call the big book, the Biblios, the Bible. That's what it really means, just a big book. Yeah, hey, you know, Biblios, big, big book. Bible. Collection of books, collection of writers, collection of these things. 
My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, various trials, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. That you may, that may finish its work, that it may be lacking nothing. Let's see, what else do we have in there? Mature is one of the words that, that you may be mature. Ooh, there's a word for you. But you know, when God spoke to me about doing James again, and to bring this out, and if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God, who giveth all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. When God said go back into it and do it again, you know, he wasn't saying you did it wrong. He wasn't saying that you know you wouldn't find more in it. But he was rather relating to me the perspective of the reality of what it is when you go through trials and tribulations, when you go through diverse temptations, when you go through these things to count it all joy. People live out their name. Whatever you name your child, whatever it means, you'll live it. And it's true in scripture, it's true in life. Michaels are Michaels. My name, Michael, Michael, means who is likened unto God. It has a question mark in it, it's a complete sense. One word, complete sense. It just simply means who is likened unto God, or who is likened unto God, or who is likened unto God, or who is likened unto God. I mean, you put the emphasis wherever you want, really, because at each age or at each reality of the times and the seasons that you go through in this life, you will put emphasis on different parts of sentence structures and it'll mean something different to you. Just like I said, who is like an unto God? Emphasis on who is. Or who is like him, that's emphasis on who is, you know. Or who is like him, they're like, you know, okay, so who is like God? Not just who, but you know, who's like God. And then who is like an unto who is like, I don't know, you mean what? So in other words, every time that you put the emphasis someplace else, it means something different. It brings out more location and interlocution of the connectivity of those words so that you can get something out of it. That being said, that's what experience in life is. You will live out your life according to the Word of God, but also your name will be a part of that living out the Word of God. Well, you could change your name, you know, you could do those things. You probably live according to that, too, because God changed his names. You know, God changed Jacob to Israel. When he was acting like Israel, God called him Israel. When he's acting like Jacob, God called him Jacob. You figure that one out. My middle name, James, you know, is very interesting because, you know, in Hebrew, my name is Ibn Michael Yaakov Ben Abraham. You know, it's like it's, Ibn is stone, um, Michael is Michael, you know, such a deal, you know. Because it's a good Jewish name. You know, Benz, uh, there's a famous family of the Benz, you know. They're um, particularly in Chicago, but there's the Benz were no, notably scribes. They were writers, you know. I mean, you know, kind of like oh, you know, figures, you know. Little did I know, because I was a raised Jewish, and then I find out, you know, with all my talents and abilities, hey, wow, my heritage, we're a bunch of scribes, you know. And every scribe instructed unto the kingdom of God is like a householder brings out of his treasure chest things both old and new. So Jesus did compliment, you know, one type of scribe, even though he kind of like, you know, had a lot to say about scribes and Pharisees. And I do know a lot about Jewish law, and Jewish halakhic and rabbinic and law, and integrity of the Nephilim, the Nephilim, and, you know, anyways. But my point is this, Ben Mikhail Yaakov Ben Abraham is Yaakov is Jacob, which is typical, you know, of the promises that were given to Jacob, that though he were like a prodigal in some ways, you know, God still blessed him and God still used him and then God produced in him, you know, the twelve tribes which were rebellious, you know, literally. I mean, yeah, Joseph, but you know, that's always kind of like the church kind of thing, so well, we won't go there for a minute. But the twelve, and so in my life, you know, I've seen how God has fulfilled my destiny in all of that. And then Ben Abraham is son of Abraham, which is just it's been designated to me because I'm a mom's or that you know, I'm a Ben Avraham because of the type of heritage that I have, I'm considered a son of Abraham. Um, which is, you know, the son of Jacob, son of, you know, but anyways, it's a long story. You have to be Jewish son, you get that one. You know, it's like, okay, you know, the yid, you yid, 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 yid. But my um, point being is this. When I got saved, I nearly died. 
I got saved pretty early on, and within a couple of years, you know, I'd been in Calvary, and I'd been, you know, going along, and you know, there was a serious illness that God had given me as a blessing, not a curse. Now, some people will call it a curse, you know, because maybe it's under the curse of the bar world and what God did to it. But I don't see it so much that way. I've had lots of years to, you know, investigate this, you know, to understand it and to comprehend it, and how it's worked in my life for a blessing and not a curse. Or he's turned the curse into blessing, my morning into dancing, he's making joy, where I could count it all joy, including the fact that I'm a Crohn's disease patient, that I have an incurable disease. I have something that, at times, is eating away at me, that wants to work against me that is what we call an autoimmune deficiency syndrome that at times it treats the body as a foreign object and says ew ick you know kind of like what our spirit supposed to do towards our flesh you know our spirit work against flesh well God gave me Crohn's disease to make a physical practical reality teaching of what part of Crohn's could be used for in teaching others about what there can be, as far as the spirit works against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit, and why your flesh is sinful and it works against your health. It's not healthy when you're in sin. And I can make that directly applicable to all aspects of Crohn's disease, which is kind of an interesting teaching sometimes, so sometime we'll get into it. But my point is this. When I had Crohn's disease, I didn't know it, you know, and it, when it finally acted up and it attacked me and it made me deathly ill, I went down to, oh, I don't know, about the first time I think I went down to 90 pounds. You know, and I went from, you know, like, oh, 140, I was always five foot, from about seventh grade till twelfth grade, I was five foot, yeah, till eleventh grade, I was five foot and about 140, so I was kind of like roly poly. And then I went nine inches, so five foot nine, and one year, my high school senior year, I went nine inches, just shot right up, boom, you know, didn't grow anymore. So I'm five foot nine with 140 with my normal weight. Which is kind of thin for that. But then uh, when Crohn's disease acted up, I went from 140 down to 90 pounds. And I was pretty thin. You know, I don't look always so healthy now all the time. Although most of the times, right now, most people that know me, they don't know that I have Crohn's. So it's kind of like coming out. So in the book of James, you know, we see that we count it all joy. And you don't learn to count right off the bat. You experience things first. Then you learn how to count. You experience education. You experience this idea of looking at something and calling it a one. You know, you don't know what a one is. You don't go, hey, that's a one. You know, no, somebody has to tell you what it is. Somebody has to educate you in order to understand that one is one, two fingers is two, three, four, five. We could have just easily called that a five. Five, one, three, six. You know, I mean, you know we could have called it anything. But we're educated by our cooperative experience knowing this, that these are what we have said they are and that they work for us and that they operate according to certain rules in math and the law of science that works in the universe to call this one as one or zero as zero. And if zero really is a single integer, so it's one. I know, that doesn't make sense, does it? Zero is one, so one plus zero is two. <laughs> eh, don't go there. It's a long story in math. Well, my point is simply that in Crohn's disease, it was killing me, and I had been a born-again, spirit-filled, walking in the spirit, really way out to, you know, like the, the first heavens, you know, kind of, kind of spiritual person, you know, shy, terribly shy, completely intimidated by everybody and everything, tender to the nth degree. I mean, people could sneeze, and I'd be, Ooh, you know, like, Ooh, church mouse. You know, but not that bad, but pretty pretty close. You know, I'd keep it hidden. You know, because you know you learn a harder exterior, but inside, oh yeah, I was marshmallow. You know, and I still can be marshmallow, although people don't know that. You know, but inside the warrior is a child. You know, uh, Twilight Paris once said. But my point is simply that in suffering, I suffered. There was a time for ten years of my early Christian walk that I spent on an average, the small average. Usually about five months flat on my back in bed or in bed of some type in the Long Beach VA hospital. Most of my time during um, the 70s and early 80s, besides being at Calvary for a couple of years, was spent inside of the hospital and nobody visited. There were no Christians come see me. I, you know, I put calls in, you know, different things, but nobody ever visited. Nobody ever came. You know, I never saw anybody. Nobody visited. Family didn't visit. Mother didn't visit. Didn't have a father. You know, long story. Um, 
But the point is that you know, I spend a lot of quality time alone with God, studying because I had my strong concordance and I had my Bible, and I was, you know, like the way I am today. I was pretty joyful, even though I was only 90 pounds. And I was studying, you know, God was talking to me, you know, at the time, and I was learning lots of things. I was listening to Chuck on the radio, you know, KYMS, you know, and I was listening to cassettes, you know, I had cassettes, you know, I'd get them at times. And um, I would go through these long bouts of, like, I would be totally disabled and just sit in a dog, and I would have vomit coming out, and I'd have bloody diarrhea, and I'd have weight loss where I could go, like, drop 10 pounds of fluids and blood loss and, you know, vitamins and nutrients and everything else overnight. You know, I could drop, you know, 5, 10 pounds one night and drop 10 or 20 the next day, you know, and I'd be down to, you know, nothing uh, real quick. But I was still walking. The weird thing was that I was still functioning. I would go to work. I would actually be working at 80 pounds. So it's possible. You see, when you see the Holocaust and you remember those images and those pictures, it's what I looked like. You know, the neck that is just there with bone. You know, I could... The, the, the hard part for me to, to grasp, you know, today, because I didn't take pictures, was that I could take my hand and wrap it around my neck. I could just about close my fingers. I could do that on all parts of my body. There was just bone. And so what they did in those days was that they would bring me in, and then they would put a central line in my heart. And you can kind of see some scars here a little bit, you know. Maybe it's this side too. Oh, I got both sides. That's right. And so, there's some scars here that you can see that what they, there it is, two scars, yeah, and then there should be two more right above it, yeah. Um, they would put what's called a central line where they would stick an IV into right above my heart, feeding into my heart valve this, what's called intralipids, which was a new kind of, you know, technique that they were putting fat, liquid fat, it was a white bottle, intralipids from Switzerland, into my heart so that I would get fat going into the blood system that would eventually get out to the cells and it would begin to put fat content back into my musculature that I didn't have, that I didn't have any... My body was so depleted and so dehydrated and so deficient that they needed to... what is called hyperalimentation. They needed to give me constant fluid, constant blood in this arm, Fluids in the heart, you know, I had I had IVs actually in both arms and I had a IV in my central heart, which was kind of like interesting because then I'd get up from bed, <laughs> which is kind of funny. <laughs> I'd get up and pull all the poles around, you know, and I'd have, you know, the one pole, you know, that was like pumping into my heart and I'd go walk around the VA hospital. And I spent years like that. I didn't just go in for like six months, get all filled up, you know, and then go out, you know, and then gone. No, what happened was that I'd be in the hospital, you know, there for a while, you know, and get filled up, fed up, you know, and blessed and whatever, encouraged, I don't know, but... Then I'd go back out, you know, and I'd go, bam, crash and burn, you know. The disease would, at some point in time, ravish my body. And I, you know, had emotional issues with that. I'd go out, you know, in the parking lot and argue with God and scream at him and yell, what's going on? I want to know. But God would answer. That was what the weird part was. God would answer me. And he would tell me and use James, you know, to count all joy. And I would laugh and I'd sing because I had all kinds of worship songs that I really enjoyed. And I'd sing them personally between him and I. We would have a unique and distinctive relationship because I would have him minister to me in the hospital. And the longest time that I was ever in a hospital during those 10 years was finally, I spent eight months flat on my back. At the end of those eight months, I was legitimately what we used to call institutionalized in the VA. Um, when a Vietnam vet was institutionalized, that simply meant that his mindset was so used to being inside the hospital that he was no longer functioning outside the hospital. He couldn't make the reality connection. It's similar to PTSDs that they come up with now and they come up with all kinds of weird ideas of trying to explain why you make killers out of people in the military. You send them out and you bring them back and you expect them to act normal. It doesn't work that way. If you've been killing, you're a killer. That's all it is. Oh, you did it in the name of your country, but you're still a killer. you got blood on your hands. You're Cain. Sorry. You're not able. You, know? you can't build the temple of God. you got blood on your hands. It's the way it is. You know? I know. I didn't kill anybody, and I still haven't. I have no, there's no blood on my hands, but I tried. I joined the military, you know, because I was going to be drafted, so I joined. I went in the military and got sick, you know, figures. God yanked me out of there. I was like, I want to be a killer, God. I want to kill for you. You know, yeah, right, you know, God yanked me out of that one. No. You know, and that was why I wound up with Crohn's, you know, partially. Now, God uses things like that in our life to bring about His witness, His testimony. And that's why it says to 
Count it all joy when you fall into divers trials and tribulations, knowing that the working of our faith produces patience. But that patience have his perfect work, that the man of God might be matured or grown up or developed into all he's supposed to be. God wanted me to learn from those experiences what suffering was like. Oh, I know what the agony of what it's like to have every muscle in your body lock up. I know what it's like to have your entire cavity opened up half of your guts taken out, cut up, taken rid of, gotten rid of, and given an ostomy. You see, I've had an ileostomy, a bag on my side for, oh, I don't know, 40 years? <laughs> I don't know. About as long as I've been a Christian, no. Probably 30 years, so almost as long as I've been in ministry. You know, it's like, God, sent, God put me in a ministry about 38 years ago, about the second year of, I was a Christian, you know, is that... God said, there is a place for you in my kingdom. You know, he never said what, but you know, I was like, okay, then he said, go. You know, well, uh, so God called me, you know, I just, you know, it took a long time to kind of get around to it, you know, <laughs> around to it. And he took me a long way around to it because I had to learn the experiences. I wanted to, I didn't need the book knowledge, I had that. I was supernaturally enthused with a lot of things that some, you know, people still wonder today about. You know, my sister says, no way, it's not possible. I went, I don't know, don't ask me. Uh, but she doesn't believe it. Anyways, God, I lived it. But my point is, those ten years taught me the value of suffering. It taught me the joy of how you could be like, you know, in the midst of pain. You know, I mean, the the VA at that point in time, because of Vietnam and because there were people dying in the Long Beach VA hospital, I saw die through um, malpractice. You know, I mean, they were doing the best they could, but they were practicing. You know, and that's what medicine is. It's a practice. You got to expect some people will die just because it was an accident, and it happened. A lot of it happened, and later got busted for, and they did a major investigation, and you know, finally kind of brought out a lot of that stuff. But they practiced on me for a long time, trying different things and techniques and different venues and avenues that, in those days, they didn't know what was going on. They called it regional entritis, regional proctitis, ileitis, granulomus colitis, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis. You know, I just kind of went through the gamut, you know. And I spent time in Long Beach VA Hospital, San Diego Balboa Naval Hospital, uh, Livermore VA Hospital, San Francisco VA Hospital, uh, all the VA hospitals in Oregon, you know, and even one in Washington. <laughs> you know, I managed to go up and down the coast because, you know, I didn't die. You see, somewhere along the line, God said to me, you know, is that, first of all, let me explain something. During those times, yeah, I nearly died. One, the first time I nearly died, I was I came in so bad that I had like 104 camp. You know, I was sweating profusely. I was, you know, delirious. I'd just gotten off work. You know, I was working at 7-Eleven, you know. I felt like I was sick, got on the Long Beach uh, bus, you know, and said, if I pass out, drop me off at Long Beach VA Hospital. And so they took me to the Long Beach VA Hospital and made sure that I walked in the emergency room. They saw me, packed me in ice, you know, started IVs. I mean, I had ice, you know, I had ice where you don't want to know I had ice. You know, and they were like, I was packed in ice and they were putting in IVs and they were doing stuff, you know, and they said that I nearly died. And they said that, that was, you know, you know, it's like really bad. You know, let's don't go there. I can tell you all the statistics and the numbers, but you don't want to know. So I nearly died the first time. You know, now two other times I nearly died. Once was in the operating room, you know, when they finally did a colectomy. Once was when they gave me wrong blood. You know, they gave me old positive over old negative or something. But the point being is simply this. In the midst of it, Jesus with me. I mean, I'm babbling like I am today. You know, I was no different. There was a point where I thought that I had lost my faith. You know, I, I wrote about an exposition of a human being, a book I wrote. And um, I looked in the mirror and I saw no joy in my eyes, you know. And God had to bring that back later, you know. And he brought that through the venue of, you know, some um, intense worship time where he gave me the ability to play guitar because I had always wanted to play guitar and could never play guitar. He gave me the ability to pick, and he gave me the ability to play. And I started playing bar chords. I mean, not bar chords. I started playing major chords and then minor chords, and I started picking and grinning. You know, I mean, so I worshipped. You know, and it was a long story. It took me a long time to recover and to recuperate. And that last time that I nearly died, you know, was that I was in eight months. That I didn't. They didn't think I was going to make it. So they shipped me, you know, to a, a convalescent you know, care place to hopefully pass away because they just didn't know what to do with me you know, half the time. And so, you know, I wound up surviving, and all through the years I've gone through health and disease and health and disease, and I've worked as hard as a journeyman boilermaker, you know, and been 
way up there doing all these hard, sweaty, you know, manifold, you know, picking up hundreds of pounds, you know, and doing all kinds of really hard back-breaking work, to as simple as, you know, like, you know, computer work, network engineering. You know, I've always had to adapt, you know, because after a while, Reagan threw me out of the VA hospitals, you know, and took away all my bennies, you know, and was like, well, then I had to make do on my own, and kind of like, okay, well, now we got to survive. And God told me one time to get off of, you know, Social Security, so I did, you know, and I kind of started a whole big rigmarole, and I started working and making my own living, you know, and God provided for me by my living. You know. And always frustrating to my family was this whole idea of this disease, you know, that was affecting me, and so they still have this kind of, like, fear over, like, oh, is Michael got weight on? Oh, is Michael working? No, don't let him work, don't let him work, don't let him work! You know, I mean, so, so I was like, well, you know, it's kind of like, I'd work it, you know, you gotta work, you don't work, you don't eat. But you see, that's not true, because I have not worked and ate, and it wasn't through welfare and other things. There were miracles that God's done, and God does things like that. And you can survive without working, if God is the one providing. And God has taken care of me all along the way. So, in the book of James, you know, we're told to count it all joy when we fall into divers trials and tribulations, and that if any man lack wisdom, let him ask for God of great thumb, give it to all liberally. The wisdom that came along was that some man from outside the VA system came and told me, you know, to get surgery, and they... They um, gave me surgery and gave me my ileostomy, you know, and I was able to use that, you know, to my benefit to become healthier, even though I still at times have gone down to, yeah, I, you know, um, before I moved here to Utah, I had a serious condition where I had a blockage, and I dropped 20 pounds, and it was a pretty serious, you know, problem that I had. I was also dying from kidney failure, and... Um, um, they, they, they were like getting ready to ship me up to ICU, you know, they kind of moved me over to, you know, they, they, they saw I responded. Every time that they were ready for me to kick the bucket, I responded. God would intervene. God would heal me, even though I went through the time of hospitalization. Because God said something interesting way back when, when I first had my episode with Crohn's disease. He said, you shall not die, but you shall declare my works unto the children of men. There's a psalm that says that, you know, it says, You shall not die, and it's a beautiful psalm, and I love it, you know, it says everything that I've ever lived, and I've lived it out. The book of James, for me, has always been a life-living process, that I have lived out the words, literally, of every single nuance of the details of the words that are in there. So whenever I lack wisdom, I'd ask God, God, do you want me to go to the hospital, or what do you want me to do? And I'd figure out sometimes on my own not to go to the hospital. Pepsi and Fritos kept me alive. People say, oh, you know, you got Crohn's disease, you ought to be on, you know, this kind of healthy diet. Yeah, it nearly killed me. All the different diets they tried about killed me. Tore up my inner guts, tore up all kinds of things. Why did I drink Pepsi? Good question. Because God inspired me at different times to try different things. God would say, you know, whatsoever you put your hand to, drink it. You know, I put my hand to Pepsi because I like Pepsi, you know, drank it and I like, took away the gaseous problems I was having chewed up the food that I was having um, problems with the gastrointestinal issue instead. I wouldn't sufficiently produce the acids in order to chew up the food. So it, Pepsi would chew it up for me. You know, it was kind of interesting. And the, whatever cornmeal does, I don't know, but for some reason, Fritos work. You know? So whenever I'm sick, you know, I go back to Fritos and Pepsi, or I go back to uh, matzo ball soup, which really works good for me. I mean, it cures everything. You know, man, I'm just loving it. You know, like, Lots of also, you know. And I've been kosher at one time, you know, I went for that, you know, it was kind of interesting, and I was kind of, eh, that was fun, for a few years, you know, and I, I've also been like, kind of like the no meat thing, you know, when I was in Calvary, you know, played that for a while and said, you know, this is just legalism, so quit doing that. But my point is this, if you lack wisdom about anything, whether it be your health, physically, you need to ask God. You need to follow not what you see on Dr. Oz, or what a doctor tells you, or what anyone else tells you, pastor, deacon, elder, counselor, richer, or whatever person it may be. You need to ask of God who abradeth not, but give it to all men liberally, because all of what I've lived out from the book of James has reminded me that I cannot go by my own understanding, like Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says. If I had, I'd be dead. If I had not done and gone and did what I have accomplished in my life of grace, with the Lord Jesus Christ speaking directly to me and showing me things that I don't even talk about now, but I mean, you know, we could sometimes. But, you know, I mean, it's just like, hey, you know, God will do things with you, but you may be alone a lot. You may be separated unto Himself. He may take you, if you are someone like me, poor and needy. 
Keep you poor that you might be rich in Him. Keep you humble, although some people don't think I'm humble, well, it's hiding other things. I don't always portray myself the way that I am because of issues that I have. Like if I have an awesome problem, I'm, I may not you know, go with you to a restaurant. I may decide that, you know, my ostomy is packed or filled or I don't want to risk you know, dumping syndrome or I don't want to go through some of the issuances or obvious problems that I might have with it. Although I go swimming, you know, I've gone, you know, Ralph Benershka was a football kicker, he had an ostomy, you know, there's all kinds of people that have professional football, professional sports, all kinds of things, people that have ostomies do. Now, I could do it, I don't have a problem, you know, I mean, whatever, you know, I mean, from my hippie days, I go skinny dipping, you know, it's like, ah, I go skinny dipping, ah, you know, hot springs, you know, never mind, we won't go there. I don't do that. No, 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 <laughs> no, net, ninguno. You know, but my point is this, that, there is that with which God will take people that have disability and give them the ability when it's of His Spirit. When it's of His Spirit, then He will give them the capability to do physical things that's impossible to do. And I've been that. He will give them spiritual realities of the word of knowledge and the word of wisdom and teach things that it was impossible for them to know. I've been there. He will allow them to participate with him in personal intercourse in a relationship that even Paul talked about he had and we should pursue like an Enoch or like a Paul or like a John. And I have. And it cost me. You know, I mean, I don't I don't sit in the council of the mighty. You know, I'm not I'm not Greg Glory, you know, I'm not Raw Reese. I'm not uh, Mike McIntosh. I'm not with Chuck Smith. I'm not. I'm not like in a mega church. You know. I'm not operating according to what these men of God, God bless them, have and do. You know. And some of them are still learning. You know. Like when Greg lost his child, he learned a lot about death. Me, I face death right off the bat, man. I have no problem with death and dying or counseling or counseling people in death because I went to counseling services in order to teach that. You know. And then also went to the Bible in order to teach it. <laughs> First responder. Yeah, I lived it. But my point is, God blesses you if you go through suffering. God chooses you to go through suffering. God wants you to understand this life isn't about being blessed. It's about having a blessing in the midst of suffering. It's about having a blessing in the midst of poverty. Having a blessing in the midst of all of your life so that you would live an abundant life with the fullness of God in you. The heart of God is love beating in you. It is the manifestation of what the scripture says and designates it being as God is love. God is love. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And he demonstrated this love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Jesus died for us. And he demonstrated the fact that he is love. Not by the manifestation of what we try to interpret with the Canaanites, the Shivites, the Hivites, and the Gittites, and the Gedites, and the whateverites, but rather by the reality of His Son living and alive and in us and willing to share with us the fact of our Father in Heaven. The reality of knowing that our Father in Heaven will give us wisdom and will give us knowledge and will have intercourse and speak with us emotionally, devotionally, through the Word of God, through our hearing, through our seeing, through our knowing. God doesn't hold back, but He giveth liberally. If we're willing to go up the mountain, God will come down from heaven and meet with you. If you're willing to seek Him with all of your heart, your soul, mind, and strength, He will be found. If you're willing to lay down your life and be crucified to this world and the lust thereof, you'll be in heaven and you'll see things that you won't even speak of. Because it would be sin to bear witness of the testimony of where you have been and what you have seen in the highest or the lowest or the first heaven. God wants to take you where He is. God wants you to know Him as He is. God wants you to follow Him for who He is. And that's why the book of James is so important to us. James speaking as the brother of Jesus. I saw Him. He doesn't talk about Him. He says, I want to tell you about this. Count it all joy. You're going to go through it. 
Count it all joy. You're going to be nailed to the cross. Count it all joy. You're going to suffer. You're going to die. You're going to agonize. Let me tell you, Christian, it's coming. It's here. Pastors like those that I've just seen from the Chuck Smith days, from my days, from those great men of God, some of them have gone through some of this. Massive surgeries. Massive agonizing, cancers. Some survived. Some died. Some lived and saw others die. And they learned. The time is coming. And time is short. There's no doubt that we are going into a time of tribulation. Of soul. Tribulation of spirit. Tribulation of the word. Where people will shake in not knowing what the word says. It says that in the latter days that people would lack for knowledge because they're just not willing to sit down and listen. They don't want to hear the fact of the Word of God. You are going to suffer. You will be crucified. You have to deny yourself. You can't have your cake and eat it too. No, it's not about getting your car, your Harley, your house, your 401k and running around and acting like this is what the abundant life is about. I'm a witness. I bear testimony and witness of these things that are true. And I'll tell you, it ain't about what people are saying. Oh, well, you know, back then they blew it and they didn't do it. You know, Book of Acts. That me. I'm a witness. Bible's true. Word of God is true. Acts is true. Anything in it is true. You want to know? You want to argue? You want to debate? You want to have a theological introductory dissertation? Of, you know, we can give an explanation. You want to have a debate? You want to kind of come together? You know, you know, you know. Yeah, I'll go there. I'm from Jerusalem. I sat in Mahatma Yehuda arguing with yeshiva students. And I don't mean one. Huh. Bad enough, I had to argue with five or six of them until seven more came. And I'm standing in a crowd of yeshiva students arguing the Word of God, the Torah, to Torah students. Come on! Me and God. I went before the rabbinate, the rabbinate, who said, you must divorce your wife. You have to divorce your wife. It is mandatory you divorce your wife. We're not letting you leave Israel till you divorce your wife. And I said, oh, so you're going to be there when I marry her? Words of wisdom God gave me at times that blow people's minds. To this day, there is a rabbi in the rabbinate who is talking about how the chief rabbi at that point in time that was serving as the chief rabbi was furious at one little man with a beard who was in Israel who confounded the rabbi. Oh, is that something you're going to make the covenant for? Now, eventually, you know, he won the case, you know, because eventually I got divorced, you know, because, quite frankly, I granted my wife the divorce, you know. Couldn't get out of Israel, you know. <laughs> it's like $50,000 bond, you know. It's like, what? You're, you're going to hold me in Israel? Isn't that against, you know, like American policy for U.S. citizens to be held in Israel, you know, against their will? Guess what? Went to the embassy, they won't let me out. It was an interesting court case, you know, because I even went to a lawyer. I said, "Okay, now let, let's get this right. The state of Israel and the, you know America, we we handshake, right? You know, we got all this going on now." Okay, you know, I said, "I'm not making Aliyah," you know. I said, "You know, personally, you know." He says, "Well, yeah, you know, yeah, they are." Yeah. Said, but they're holding me against my will. He says, "Yeah, they are." So how are they doing that? Monetarily, you know, until you pay fifty thousand dollars, you know, you aren't getting out of the state of Israel. Is that legal? No, but it's done. So the embassy's not going to back me up? No. Can I contact the embassy? I contact the embassy. They've been back me up. So guess what? <laughs> I got Messianic Jews, Christians, people, everyone around me trying to give me advice, including Calvary, Jerusalem, you know, where I was working, you know, at the time as a missionary. You know, and I'm going, and you know, if that's around, you know, I was like, well, okay, you know. I'm going, well, this is interesting. I could either stay here permanently, you know, or I could die to myself, take up my cross and follow Jesus. God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? I give up. I am no longer I that live it, but you live in me. I cannot do any of this. This is so far beyond me. That's what God did. 
God allowed. For some people, this is going to blow their minds. This is going to like lose it completely. God allowed the divorcement of a woman who is a Christian hiding in Judaism, hiding her faith, suppressing it so that she can do what she wants to do at the time. So that she will not admit being a the follower of Jesus, much less Yeshua Mashiach. So that she could go her way and she abased herself before these men in a humiliating ceremony that's halakhic and orthodox that you take the covenant, you take the contract, you burn it, you sign it, you burn it, and you put the ashes on their face, you know, and they just they humiliate themselves before you. It's almost as bad as spitting in a shoe. It's disgusting. It's gross. I felt sick for years. <laughs> sort of. But I did. I granted her freedom. In the name of the Lord, go and do as the Lord tells you to do. Whatsoever the Lord's telling you to do, that you should do. Until that moment, I couldn't let her go because of all the quote-unquote doctrines we have in Christianity. Oh, you know, doors. Well, you know, I mean, you got to kind of go there. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God who braideth not, but giveth to all men liberal. Anyone that's been through a divorce knows that the Christian church isn't always the best one for picking up the pieces of people that have gone through divorce. And yet, in Christianity, over 50% of the Christians you're talking to married a Christian and divorced a Christian. And they were in the faith and of the faith when they did it. Over 50%. It's, matter of fact, bigger than the secular world. Interesting. Now, I could teach on divorce. I don't want to get into it here, but... My point of it all was being that God wanted me to bring it out about the disease and about the divorce because those are the two big D's, you know. That we need to not think of these things in relationship to what we have in our life. But rather we need to apply it to the perspective of what the Word of God says in James' life as he gives it to us for our living today. If any man lack wisdom... And this is to you, whoever you are, whatever reason that I'm sharing this and teaching this. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God who abradeth not, but giveth to all men liberally. The wisdom of God will be given to you in the word of God and you'll follow it and you'll live it and you'll be a testimony of it. And I don't care what it is you did or do or shall do. And I mean it in a way that they don't mean it to whoever may be counseling you or encouraging you or trying to tell you something dogmatically or doctrinally. I'm going to tell you that Abraham was the most indoctrinated of his generation and yet he failed, quote-unquote, biblical doctrine by going against the people of his land and following after a voice he heard in the wilderness. Voices in his head telling him to go somewhere and to do something and to become something. And yet, he's the father of all Jews. Literally. There were no Jews before Abraham. Sorry, there were. You know, they weren't. They were Semitic. That's all. Semitic people. So, today, if we had an Abraham, and we do, because each one of us have to live that way, if we have an Abraham, do we operate according to our doctrine? Or do we operate according to our personal relationship with God? Kind of both. I'll be honest with you. But there's going to come a time where you're going to be challenged, and as Greg Laurie was challenged, as Mike McIntosh was challenged, as Raul Reese was challenged, I don't know if um, Steve Mays was, but well, yeah, because Steve Mays kind of shared it. There are times where something's going to challenge your doctrine, and you're going to follow the Lord. Your doctrine is not set in stone, although the law is there. But the grace and the mercy with which God operates, and He uses His Spirit to make applicable this particular scripture. If any man, woman, child, lack wisdom, let him ask of God who will break the thought. Because you'll stand before God and give an answer and accountability for that particular stand of faith if you have to operate according to that. Where you go against the common flow, the common no of what you think is doctrine, which is just an idea that men made up to call whatever they think it is that's going to make us cooperate better. Quite frankly, no. But, you know, okay, fine. You know, you only got to have commonality of distinctives, you know, and directives, you know, because after all, we call it the distinctives. You know. Well, this is distinct about us. Well, I'm unique and distinctive. 
So I've got my own unique distinctive. It's called Jesus. You know, He's alive and well, living in me, and He directs me, and He's accordingly you know, providing for me and abiding with me, and I confidently have my unique distinctive in Him. Because in Him I move and live and have my being. So that's my unique distinctive. You know, So I don't have a Calvary distinctive. Although I agree with what they say. You know, it's like, you know, it works for that. For as long as you're in Calvary. When you go over here to Jewish, you know, it's like, well, you know, yeah, if you're Jewish at the Jewish Gentile Fellowship in Calvary, Costa Mesa, which I was, you know, um, yeah, it works there too. But if you go over to Israel, yeah, you're going to get into some interesting issues. Are you witnessing like, you know, the, you know, we're told to, you know, in the Calvary Distinctives, or are you just like denying Jesus so that you can stay in the land? Because that's one of the papers you have to sign in order to be a humanitarian organization or a recognized organization in Israel. And not all Calvaries, I'm not going to ask them that question because I know what happened when I was there. And I know I would not. And there were three of us. And we suffered persecution for it. Well, we did, you know, I mean, that was obvious. But, accordingly as the Word of God is true, let every man be found a liar and God be found true and God be found faithful. If the Spirit of God is teaching you, if the Spirit of God is leading you, if the Spirit of God is in you, then by the Word of God, as He gives you that knowledge, with wisdom, let it so be that if any man lack wisdom, he had asked of God, and then God answers him. Which is why I say to you, whoever you are, whatever you are, wherever you are, however you're dealing with this, whatsoever the Lord tells you to do, that you should do. There will be consequences. It may not make sense to anyone else. But it's your faith, it's your relationship, and it's your God, and it's the one who saved you the one who created you, the one who made you, the one who has blessed you, the one who has given you his spirit and who holds you just like this. And it ain't all state. It's God the Father who loves you. And he died for you. And you will make it. No matter what you go through. And you may go through things you won't understand. Trust in the Lord. Do. I do. And that's wonderful. I love it. I'm living it. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Lean not in thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him. And He'll direct your path. It may be an interesting path. You may go through mountaintops. And you may go through valleys. You may be on some highs and some lows. And you may go from the uttermost, northernmost parts of Alaska to the Middle East, to the very steps of Jerusalem, and to Golgotha. And be crucified. And come and be resurrected. And still live and yet say, These are the things that I have seen, O oh God. These are the things I have heard, O oh man. These are the things I have handled with my own hands, O oh ye who know not God. And I can declare to you, to the uttermost heavenly heavens, to the uttermost depths of hell, Jesus is alive and living and well in me. And He can be in you. And God has so provided a way of salvation that you can accept it freely by the grace that He's given you. That He loves you so much. He died for you. He loves you so much. He wants you to be with Him. He loves you so much He'll do anything to meet with you, to explain it to you, to give to you salvation. Because He's provided it for you. By His death, by His resurrection, and by His coming again in glory. Because He's coming for you. One way or another, baby, He's coming. And it won't be long now, and we're going home.